here, eh? and this afternoon will be here, very near, but tomorrow the conference will be in another location, eh? which is still in the, so nearby and easily reachable by bus and so on, but they're not in the center of the town. You have more room there and so on. Uh, okay, so I would continue with presentation. Who wants to be next? In order to have some time also. So I, I try to be concise in order to have some time for discussion. You want to be? So which is your presentation? Just uh, talking. Okay. It's always quite amazing to see like the cool CAPS projects and the variety of topics they line up. So I have some nice slides tomorrow afternoon and I thought today is just uh, giving a quick overview. So my name is Christian Voigt from the Center for Social Innovation in Vienna and I'm representing the Make It project make-it.io, so if you want to access it, and as the name says, it looks after the maker movement. So we already heard something about it, like from the last presentation, DSI. And essentially, uh, I mean, most of you, I just think it, you're aware of the maker movement and physical computing and 3D printing and additive technologies, etc. So for those who are not aware of it, uh, I would quickly say, mention two examples. So one example is um, there was an event which was hugely reported in, in the news, in YouTube, which uh, presented the production, the 3D printing of the first gun. So basically, you could download uh, their sketches, their drafts for printing a 3D gun, and you could use it once, and I don't know where the technology is right now. But essentially, it was a huge threat, or at least perceived as a huge threat, because you know customs wouldn't stop you to import guns if you have the right tools in the country where you want to uh, apply them. Uh, it was actually framed as a quite different discourse. It was about intellectual freedom and what you do with knowledge. And then a second example which followed close after was like um, um, another YouTube video which showed, the uh, which showed the making of some prosthesis for people who lost uh, you know, limbs, arms, legs in the course of uh, war. And it highlighted the economical uh, um, affordability of those um, 3D printed uh, parts. So essentially, you can see with those two examples, like what's the range of um, the users the maker movement could put to, or what could be the outcome of it. And in the makeit.io uh, project, what we are looking at is a range of cases where we asked exactly this question, like, you know, what socioeconomical and technical and literacy conditions in society do we need in order to push more of the positive effects and maybe create more awareness and contain the negative effects. And, and yes, tomorrow we have a few more um, precise questions, but essentially it's a very exciting uh, research journey because we talk to people who produce devices for purification of water, we talk to people who have really crazy educational board games for kids, and we think that there is a huge potential which um, isn't coming to full uh, effect, and that would be one of the main aims of the project. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to be next? It's not really a presentation, it's just a teaser. Uh, regarding the workshop we are having this afternoon in room one, starting from two o'clock. So basically we are analyzing how openness and cooperation can enhance internet policy making. And uh, we are analyzing a selection of example of various processes at the national and uh, international level 
that allow to produce uh, advice, policy suggestions, recommendation, and to allow to a variety of stakeholders to interact. And so to produce this kind of recommendations, we are, we are analyzing the United Nations Internet Governance Forum, so not just as a forum for debate, but also as a forum to elaborate concrete policy solution that can stimulate legal interoperability, and this is something that I will deal with in my presentation. Then we will have uh, some case studies from national uh, institutions that already exist to allow various stakeholders to create synergies and uh, develop joint initiatives, advise the government, uh, the, uh, con the Conseil National du Numérique, uh, which is the uh, French body that uh, deals with this kind of suggestion and, and initiatives in France, will be rep represented by uh, Daniel Kaplan, that I think is not yet arrived. Uh, ah, here, he's there. <laughs> Uh, then, who is member of the board of the Conciliation of the Numeric. Then we'll have uh, Carlos Afonso, who is uh, a leading Brazilian expert and also a uh, member of the Com Comité Gestor d'Internet, uh, which is the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, which, which was the first entity created uh, in this regard and has uh, more than 20 uh, years of experience in this. So the Brazilian were really the first one creating this kind of entities. And our the Brazilian example is considered the, the, the benchmark, uh, the international benchmark of this kind of entities. Uh, we will have uh, Richard Hill, which is the gentleman that was ma making some comments this morning, analyzing, uh, well, let's say that pr providing some critiques to this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder models. He has been working for the ITU for more than 20 years and then has now is a, the, the founder of the uh, Association for Proper Internet Governance and provides critiques on multi-stakeholderism and on a variety of other issues. And then we have uh, Stefano Trumpi, who is somewhere uh, probably still having coffee, <laughs> uh, who is the president of uh, ISOC Italia and also the father of the Italian internet. He is the one that connected Italy to internet uh, with the first uh, stable link with ARPANET, which is the uh, father of, uh, I mean, the, the, the ancestor of the internet. And importantly, we, over the past two months, we have been elaborating a joint paper. So we have exploited col collaboration in order to provide concrete suggestions. And the paper now is open. Uh, for you to comment it. So if you want to check it, to comment, to provide feedback, is on the workshop page. You have a Google Doc in which that you can open and provide uh, critique, suggestion, every feedback is really welcome. At the end of the paper, we also have a model for a multi-stakeholder uh, internet policy advisory body. Uh, we know that at, in this moment, there is great appetite for this kind of bodies from national government. Uh, the Italian government, uh, sadly, uh, Stefano is not here, but the Italian government is, tr is trying to uh, pushing for this kind of uh, initiative since several years, and Stefano has been very active in, in this kind of efforts, but uh, so far nothing concrete has been uh, achieved from the institutional perspective, although from the, uh, fr from the substance perspective, a declaration of internet rights, a an internet bill of rights has been elaborated last year with, to, through a multi-stakeholder open process. So we will analyze all these uh, case studies and provide a critical approach. You are all invited both to the workshop and to provide comments to the paper. The workshop is in room one, uh, starting from two. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I think the last one. No, that. Uh, so come. <laughs> okay. So Thank you. What is the next step of the search? Hi, everybody. I'm Leonardo Maccari, and the uh, World Package Coordinator of NetCommons. NetCommons is another CAPS project. It started in January. And it's coordinated by the University of Trento, and we have seven different um, participants, three computer science uh, departments, two law departments or research center, uh, one uh, department for social science, and finally one ONG from Switzerland. And what do we deal with? Okay, uh, we deal with community networks. I will just spend a few words about uh, what a community network is. 
A community network is a network, like a real physical communication infrastructure that communities of people build with a bottom-up approach. Uh, Mayo mentioned Giphy in the previous pre presentation, and Giphy is one of the most known community network. Basically, they are normally started as mesh wireless network, which means that people climb up the roofs of their houses and they put uh, wireless antennas and they start building networks. With this approach, they build networks that range from hundreds of nodes, tens of nodes, to tens of thousands of nodes. So for instance, uh, over there you have a map of Rome, and there is a network that is called Linux. Over there you have a map of uh, Germany, and there are several hundreds of different networks in Germany. And this one is a map of Giphy, which covers basically all Catalonia. That uh, denser area there is Barcelona, just to let you understand the, the size. So why is this important in this context? It is important because many of the things that I've heard today, and also from Fabrizio Sestini, they actually rely on the fact that people, first of all, they have access to some digital communication instrument. And second, this digital instrument allows them to do whatever they want, which is actually not true in many cases because still we have like two-thirds of the world population that doesn't have access to the internet. And then, the concentration of power that we have and we have been speaking of today in the services is the same if you go down to the network layer, so to the physical infrastructure, market concentration and, and so on and so forth. For instance, uh, in Europe, still half of the broadband connections, they are in the hands of the ex-incumbent. So these kind of networks are really interesting because they use a bottom-up approach. They use the network and they govern them as commons and they try to build alternative networks that in some cases they work as a replacement to overcome digital divide. In some other cases they are just networks for people that won't communicate to each other. So very briefly, what do we do? Well, this is, it's a thing that is really not really well understood. Uh, we try to understand how they organize and how they govern their networks, which is not easy at all. And then we try to give them instruments that they can use also in terms of software. And then we try to approach the thing uh, with a broad view. And we try also to extract some wisdom from their practice to move it upstream and see if this is a successful model, and it, we hope that it will be even more successful, how can we actually reuse some of the principles and put them on the internet, so on, the, on a wider angle? And that's why we need so uh, different disciplines in the project. And that's it. Thank you very much. So, quick. So clearly, from all these uh, discussions, and, and then Anna will... Uh, uh, survey all the keywords that uh, emerged from uh, this conference uh, up to now. So please, uh, what's your... So hello everyone, I'm very glad for being here. I'm Panagiotta from Draxis in Thessaloniki, Greece. And uh, I'm here as a representative for, of our CAPS project uh, with uh, the name Hacker. Hacker is all about building an open source platform to enable um, communities of citizens to build their own networks of, uh, for monitoring uh, and accessing air quality information. So we identified that the actual problem is not the air pollution itself, but the fact that uh, Europeans are not aware about the quality of the air that they breathe. Uh, so the need is to provide citizens with uh, useful estimations of air quality uh, in order to fill the gaps in areas where no monitoring stations exist and uh, improve access to air quality data across many sources and not only from the official monitoring stations and of course to provide this data uh, in real time. We are six partners from uh, five European countries and uh, 
our utmost goal is to raise awareness on air quality and um, on how people can protect themselves from uh, higher pollution uh, levels. And we want to provoke behavioral change toward cleaner air in Europe. Uh, so, high care is all about uh, making the problem of air pollution visible and its uniqueness is, is that it will be open source and uh, available for everyone to set up it and uh, build it uh, for uh, their own needs. We will use pictures of the sky as a measurement tool and uh, we will provide instructions to citizens on how to build their own sensor in order to monitor the air that they breathe. We are envisioning that our end users will be uh, communities of uh, health and uh, air quality organizations, uh, research institutions on the air quality, as well as businesses and projects uh, uh, that manage uh, air quality data. Uh, so, like in the natural, we obtain air quality information from four sources. First of all, from mobile images that uh, users uh, take and upload in our app, from uh, ha open air hardware sensors uh, that users build, and from low-tech low measurements, and of course, uh, from uh, open air quality data from official monitoring stations. Then we integrate all this data and we um, apply a data fusion model and we provide this information to our members through a web portal which they can customize uh, to their needs. Uh, as I told you, uh, we obtain uh, pictures of the sky either from social media or uh, our users can uh, upload these uh, pictures directly to the high care applications. These pictures should be geolocated and uh, presents a fishing part of the clear sky. And then with the hacker algorithm, we can estimate uh, the concentration of the particulate matter in the air. Uh, as I told you, we provide our, uh, our users with tutorials and instructions on how to build their own sensor in order to, ha to have a, a coarse picture of the air quality. Also, low-tech measurements, this is an option for uh, users who are not so uh, experts, who, who have uh, no experience uh, building things. Um, and the fourth option is from open air quality uh, data. We are going to pilot test our solution in two countries, in Germany with uh, our uh, partner, uh, which is uh, Grassroot. Uh, environmental NGO uh, with about uh, 500,000 members. Uh, they are environmental activists. And in Norway uh, with uh, some health interest groups. So we are organizing a workshop today. Uh, this is the first international workshop on um, environmental monitoring uh, based on data from the web and social media. We are at room 13. The scope of the workshop is to present all the relevant work in this area and to discuss the actual needs of our end users and uh, of the environmental experts. Here you can see the agenda and let me tell you that we have a panel discussion at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon and we will be glad to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Franca Lucati, and I work for uh, the city of Milan, the Smart City Office. Uh, today, I would like to present to you our project, but in particular, I would like to underline why it's important for us that a public administration is a part uh, in this project. Uh, Open Care is a project that uh, tries to rethink care. So as uh, every one of us knows, uh, traditionally communities are the main caregivers, were the main caregivers. But uh, from the 19th century, the system of care completely changed. And so as uh, uh, it's clear that uh, um, 
the, the approach of care uh, is completely changed. We have a professionalized care, a one-size-fits-all approach, and a top-down model. But uh, it's more and more clear in the last years that uh, the welfare state uh, is in a big uh, crisis for a lot, a lot of reasons that now we have no time to mention, but uh, for a problem of cost, but also for a problem of the kind of model. Um, so now we have this situation. We have on one side the public administration with this urgent need to think again, policies and services. And on the other side, we have many experiences around the world of uh, sharing, where uh, there are services driven by communities that are using open technologies and uh, uh, also in uh, a um, self-organized way. Uh, so, for a public administration, it's interesting to be here because it's uh, more and more important to uh, co-create services with uh, communities and uh, to find uh, ways uh, user-centered to create services. So, uh, Open Care, that is uh, a project that aims to prototype uh, a community-driven model of addressing social and uh, health care and explore its implication and scale. We, uh, how? With uh, three main act action that are uh, uh, digital fabrication and cheap and open hardware technology. So we have uh, interesting activities in a fab lab based in Milan. Then um, we have a platform uh, that is opencare.cc where there are uh, online communities and the idea is to rise the global hacker community to look for solutions to care problems. And then there is another level that is the level of collective in intelligence research. Let's have a quick look. So, um, the platform uh, was uh, developed in a platform in a community online that already exists, that is Edge Riders, and uh, it's, uh, we have uh, 158 users now and uh, more than 1,700 comments, and the people are posting stories about care and the solution that they found for a problem of care. So people try to share a solution, problem, tools, and sharing their stories. Uh, but uh, we, but uh, it's uh, really important for us uh, also to, um, to do some local activities. And so we have uh, a, an, um, a pilot action uh, in Milan uh, where uh, there are activities of engagement of citizens, but also a co-design activities uh, co-design activities uh, where uh, citizens together uh, co-create and prototype uh, solutions for real and particular problem of care. Um, all these, uh, sorry, all these things uh, are reported on platforms and also with documentation and in this way everyone can do it again. Uh, one minute. Uh, the ERD project consortium that is interesting because uh, there are universities, public administrations, but also a fab lab. Uh, and so uh, the one of the challenge of the project is the partnership. And uh, um, here at the end, uh, an idea of uh, the project. So open care is a connector between you that could be uh, a people in need, uh, an elderly people, uh, elder, could be elderly people, uh, young people, and uh, your goals. And you can um, uh, find, and, uh, find ways uh, to reach your goals in different ways, so by workshop, by meetings, and uh, also to participate to the online uh, communities. And so if you are interested in this project, if you need more information or only if you want to be part of this, uh, uh, to be part of this uh, community, you can write uh, this here, uh, you can find every contact. Thank you. Okay, so I move to the round table. Just uh, Anna, is it? Yeah, no. And, uh, but uh, I just want to ask uh, you for the last time if you want to join the social uh, dinner tomorrow because I have to confirm uh, and, and also to give some uh, 
instruction how to go there. Ah, you are uh, uh, okay. So come here to choose. So um, uh, we don't have here in the, in the social. So if you have a screen a, much, a bit larger than this one, here you see where is the, uh, you can see the, where is the social dean? It is the Ristorante, Ristorante Cafaggi, just for those of you who want to join us, who is uh, in the center, Via Guelph, uh, and uh, here is, uh, you have the menu. So, it's up to you. I'm, I'm not paid uh, by the restaurant. <laughs> so please, uh, Johannes, uh, come and coordinate the, the next session. Maybe this is another one. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ioannis Tavrakakis from the University of Athens. I was asked by Anna a few days ago to uh, coordinate this, uh, this discussion. Uh, I was involved in uh, Ein's project. I'm not involved in CAP's pro projects. Um, and we have about half an hour, so uh, I'm not sure how to do this. I think we have uh, about 12 projects if I took correct notes. So probably I will suggest that uh, um, maybe we cannot have everybody here, uh, or maybe we can. Um, so, so maybe, maybe w we can do it like this because uh, there are several people uh, involved. So. Um, what I would like to, to do is the following, since we don't have a lot of, uh, much time. Uh, first, uh, uh, since this round table is about uh, crucial CAPS issues, uh, probably I would like to start with the most crucial one, which is that of engagement. You know, if you don't have people participate, you don't have uh, anything. Uh, so probably the most crucial one is that of engagement. Uh, another one has to do with the fact that most of the times humans are in the loop. And when humans are in the loop, there are all kinds of weird things happening uh, from lack of expertise, lack of interest, uh, unpredictable behaviors, etc. So what will be the impact on the data collected and the service delivered at the, at the end of the day um, because of that? Also, what is the impact of CAPS products uh, on humans. Um, uh, of course, most of the projects say that the, you know, these platforms are great things and can uh, contribute in that and the other way to, to humans, etc., and society. But at the end of the day, if you think uh, uh, long term and if you think about humans, are there any side effects on humans? You know, trying to be provocative here. Uh, the question about data, openness of data, which will make them very useful to everybody, and the question of privacy. There is a trade-off there that uh, some projects touched on. Um, the, coming to your specific project, maybe if you want to emphasize uh, a, a big challenge or a big benefit or a provocative 
uh, idea or approach that you have taken so that we stimulate discussion, then that's another possibility to do it. You know, choose from your own uh, menu of challenges, uh, focusing more on the more innovative and the more risky and the more uh, out of straight thinking kind of approach that you took, uh, which could be provocative a little bit. Um, this is as a starting point, so I don't know um, uh, who would like to make a comment on these aspects or any, any, any aspect uh, uh, from the project participants. I guess that's the danger of not bringing the people here. <laughs> Everybody is hiding. Um, sure. Um, Can you hear me? You can. Uh, okay, there's a lot of talk about the internet, but I think the, the problem is, or the what is going to change the uh, society very much is artificial intelligence, and which is underpinned by the internet, maybe. Uh, I know that uh, Google, Amazon, and some of the others are talking about the uh, restructuri restructuring of work, jobs, employment, uh, and I think that is uh, something that uh, should be in the public consciousness a lot better. There are some very good books. Super Intelligence, The Last Invention, I think is a, is a good read. Um, th I think the, the collective intelligence picture, the one of the, the fish being eaten by the school of bigger fish, um, I would like to encourage the creation of something along the lines of one of the big artificial intelligence companies. I think we, sh we, need a, we need a player in Europe and we need something that generates the uh, intelligence for societal benefit and not for shareholder benefit. Okay, any questions about that? Good, I have a question, sir. Then, then, then there's three of us, and then soon enough we'll, you know, there'll be more of us up here. Uh, okay. Actually, I wanted to reinforce your point. I think what you said is exactly correct. And in terms of a European project, we could look at why is Europe been totally incapable of generating any significant ICT company except for SAP. Everybody know SAP? Okay. And we had them in the past. I mean, you're old enough to remember Honeywell <laughs> and ICL, uh, and we lost all of them, but China has them. Okay, China's not Europe, but still, I think that's a research project that's worth looking into. What did the Chinese do to have the equivalent of Amazon, Twitter, Google, Facebook, et cetera, while in Europe we can't have them? And, it, it, and is it something we want to replicate? Maybe not, you know, maybe we don't. Maybe we like being subservient to American companies. I don't know, you know, it's, a, it's an open question. And the second point that you made, which I think deserves much more research, is how many of these things are actually public infrastructure that should not be provided in a totally privatized and deregulated manner, right? Roads used to be private, if people know history. Right? Then they started being public when the military used them, and then we had the King's Road in England, and uh, mail was the same thing. Mail initially was private. People sent their own mail. It was horrible, right? And then we had the King's Mail, uh, and then we had public mail. So there's been a tendency of recognizing that certain basic infrastructure is something that is the ri a right of people. And we have several countries, including Finland, if I'm correct, which have now stated that broadband internet access is a, a civil right. Well, if it's a civil right, should it be entirely provided by totally deregulated companies? Question. And if it is, what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I think we need more research on that. And that's exactly what you were hinting at. Okay, uh, maybe I, I will suggest that we switch from the virtual round table to the physical round table. So if you would like to, uh, the representatives of the projects who made the, the presentations earlier to come here and maybe uh, have one uh, statement along uh, the questions I posed or along anything uh, you feel it's challenging, it's innovative, it's a little bit just out of the ordinary. Just a word. Since uh, in the last days I circulated the mail asking for keywords uh, or concepts to be 
part of this round table. I collected it on them on a page on the website. And clearly, if you are interested, keep continuing sending me franco.bagnoli at unifi.it uh, your keywords, suggestions, uh, points, uh, also emerging from this discussion. That uh, can be, so at least we can have a list uh, of, of them that will uh, stay there for the future. <laughs> okay, so please uh, so, uh, help yourself. Uh, please, your name and your, your project. Hi. <laughs> Okay, Panagiota from the Hacker Project. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that regarding the engagement issues that you mentioned, uh, we are trying to make our uh, platform um, some kind of a social network for people interested in, interested in air quality issues in order so that peers can motivate each other and find friends and then uh, they will, the one user motivate the other. But um, actual, actually, our uh, main concern is, um, is another one, is how we can use the data collected from our users in order to provoke policy making, uh, in order to provoke changes in policy making. Um, I mean that, uh, for example, in our project, the information is coming from low-cost sensor, uh, who, are, who are, of course, are uh, of low accuracy. So how we can um, give this information to our communities in order to push the policy makers to make some change? And what is the solution? I don't know. <laughs> That's our concern from now. For so now. this has to do with the quality of the data to some extent? Yes. Like uh, to be accepted and mm -hmm. uh, received. And I think that um, this may be a concern uh, for, for all the CAPS project because uh, the data are, uh, are generated from users. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can take turns unless you want to speak about it. Yeah. yeah, I would just like to follow up on what Your you name, said. please, and okay. project. Yeah, Everybody Chris when you talk, please. Yeah, not true enough. Uh, Christian Voigt, uh, Center for Social Innovation in Vienna. And I want to follow up on what uh, you just said, like, you know, how can we use data for policy making? And I think, like, just the recent Brexit development is a very good example to show the importance of evidence in terms of data and also how hard it is to generate the data and make sense of it. Like, you know, different political parties present different sides of the same story. They are not completely wrong, but they omit crucial data to get their point across, you know, and they don't really necessarily have uh, an appreciation of truth and uh, authenticity of data. So I could see that maybe a second side of the coin would be also the kind of data literacy and the complexity to understand so that on one side you have the political statements like human data and on the other side you have some objective numbers which would be you know uh, immigrants in the UK their involvement in the public sector what would happen if you know certain groups go away and so on because otherwise it feels very stupid to see that uh, kind of direct democracy and you know I'm not sure we should use that word and then to see the discussions in the aftermath when they realize, wow, this is what it means. So uh, th this is where I see a huge need in policy making, you know, and it extends to climate change. You know, Brexit is just one uh, on the top right now. <laughs> Thank you. From the far end, <laughs> starting. In the Wagerait project, we had the same problem. So, because there is a lot of data imported by uh, users, and not only by users, but by also by machine. Uh, so, we we created um, a mechanism that the data need to double check. So, users can double check the data, and discuss and have reviews on the data related to uh, if they are correct. And it's. Um, that uh, metric value has uh, 
um, a source that need to be seeded in each piece of information in order to someone could look up if um, this uh, metric value is um, reported correctly to the platform. Um, this is an idea for how maybe you can tackle this problem, but it uh, also depends on the project uh, sometimes. I, I guess there is some overhead there, correct? Um, yes, but uh, you can uh, import the data. Next, the, there can be a discussion on the data. So, yeah, it's not so much, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we should be taking some questions as they come up before you continue. Um, please, we have to use the microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Thanasis Tiropanis from the University of Southampton, and I hear a lot of wonderful work and people sharing data on, uh, on, on platforms. And I was wondering, uh, this is a problem that we have encountered. How do you deal with the ethical concerns when it is the model for ethics before is that we have one organization gets our data and we ha they have to have some ethical process on how they, they process the data and what they do with them. But when each of us contributes data and each of us can uh, use the data that are available, how do we deal with that? If I, how do we decide which data stay on the platform or not? There has to be some ethical framework there. And uh, how do we decide whether the data that an individual can contribute might actually cause harm to another individual because they compromise their privacy or they cause all sorts of problems? So I was wondering whether in all these practical uh, uh, cases you have encountered such issues and how you were able to cope with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. So just two comments more than questions. Name, please. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to introduce myself before. Uh, I'm Luca Belli, I am the senior researcher at the Center for Technology and Society in, at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm also the head of the Internet Governance Project at the FGV in Rio. So the, the, the two comments were not only uh, about the fact of having data, but how to convey those data to policymakers. So the question, one of the goals of the, uh, the workshop we will have this afternoon is indeed to analyze how you can have uh, advisory bodies that, ex that uh, use those data to suggest concrete policy suggestions and also can facilitate public consultations, uh, pedagogic initiatives, uh, involve the civil society within the discussion of those data. Because all, I mean, we all know that uh, data uh, driven policies should be driven by data, but also that uh, uh, policy makers are not really sensitive to data and sometimes are more sensitive to public pressure. So when civil society is in, understands what is the meaning of those data can put pressure on policy makers. And without institutions, processes that involves all the various stakeholders, business community, government, uh, civil society mainly, uh, it is not possible to achieve this outcome. So we would, would, will be stuck with excellent research, with excellent data, but uh, without bridging the gap between policymakers and research. So one of the, I, I reiterate the invitation to the workshop this afternoon because the goal is indeed to understand how research can be conveyed to policymakers, which kind, which kind of processes manage to do this, and how this data can be transformed in concrete policy suggestions that can also be used by advocates to lobby for policy change. Okay. Thank you. May and I finally, uh, before I'm sorry, <laughs> I've been waiting for too, too much time and I wanted to react to, to your remark. Uh, I'm from Russia and I work in, in live in France for four years. And I must say that in Russia, the user produce uh, a lot of data on corruption using mobile applications, crowdsourced mobile applications that were created by users, not by some uh, top-down projects. And they managed to get through um, the whole institution of corruption in Russia and to make some important changes without any advisory boards. But these are more exceptions than the rule. So we still, uh, I, I agree with you, we still need to bridge <laughs> this gap. Uh, 
I want to point to the importance of the question of uh, open data and how pa far uh, data can uh, um, fit the uh, sharing economy policies uh, because um, uh, there is uh, two type of problems. On the one hand, there is a lack of evidence about the impact of uh, sharing economy and the need of uh, data in this. And on this, uh, this is a reason to argument the uh, policy makers on the importance of digital social innovation type of models because they are based on open data and without data it's really difficult to actually uh, uh, regulate this economy so it's a, an argument in order to favor this alternative to the unicorn uber based uh, modalities of sharing economy and point that actually these modalities of economy because this is economy we call it digital social econo uh, innovation but there is actually economical model behind and 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 um, and how far this alternative economic model would be very beneficial that the policymakers support them into co contraposition to the uh, ones based in closed data and also based in large uh, multinational corporations. But the other element is that there has been documented how far uh, the very few evidence about the impact of sharing economy is been provided by uh, multinational corporations that control their own data in order to prove that, for example, Airbnb has good uh, impacts in terms of not favoring gentrification in cities. And the, the manipulation of uh, closed data platforms in order to provide data that benefit their uh, policy regulations. So it's very, very problematic, uh, and, and so we have to push about how far these models are much more beneficial, also because provide open data and it's much more transparent and more difficult to manipulate. Okay, I'm Eleni Tolli from the Capsella project. And I have to say we are a data-driven and community-driven project. So we have all these problems that have been mentioned here. Uh, we do not have so much the problem of the quality of data. I think this is more related to the projects that are uh, collecting data in a crowdsourced way. Uh, we also collect data directly from the communities. Uh, for example, we now have this activity running where communities can self-register so that we create a map of agrobiodiversity across Europe. Uh, the problem we have uh, is um, we could also call it a challenge if you wish, but uh, I prefer to, to see this as a problem so that you can really address this in, in the project, is uh, how to deal with the openness of the data. Uh, our field of activity is a, a very sensitive one, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, we, are, we are working with agrobiodiversity data, we are working with farmer communities across Europe, smallholders, but also industrialized farmers. And uh, so we have to deal on, on one side with the rural networks and bottom-up uh, initiatives. And on the other side, there are the big industries uh, that are really from, from farm to fork starting from the seed and the field and going to the food industry. And there, uh, and this, this was uh, again very obvious in the workshop we organized in Tuscany in, uh, in May uh, this year, that uh, farmers have really fear to open the data. And uh, so that uh, th th they fear that uh, they, they will make available uh, useful information and important information to the big, co uh, to the big uh, industries and uh, they will make uh, a non-proper use of their data. So while collecting requirements, we are still in this phase of, in our project of collecting requirements, uh, we follow all the guidelines that have been established by the AEC uh, and I'm talking about the ethical requirements that we have, uh, uh, we have to, to comply with. Uh, I think it's important if you talk with the communities, not only to give them a piece of paper and they sign uh, that they understood what the project is about and that uh, you will make the data available only if they wish, but that you have a real open discussion with them and not limit your contact with them in a typical uh, go and give and uh, then take what you want and then leave because this will not work if you deal with communities. 
So what we are doing is, apart from the online tool we have, and that uh, we really invite people to, to, to use this and share this, we go to the communities. We send our people to the, to the networks, we send our people to, the, to these organizations that are based in France, in Italy, in Spain, uh, in Greece, and uh, get in direct contact with these networks. We, we even have with us paperwork sometimes, and not, uh, and not register everything uh, online at the moment we are collecting this information, and this helps a lot. We are a project that wants to develop ICT applications for the farmers, and this is a sector that is facing currently a huge gap. While the farmers, for example, in Holland are already talking about machine-to-machine -machine applications, and uh, the industrialized farming has reached uh, a new point, small farmers, uh, so small farmers face huge problems of existence. So we are something in between. Uh, still, also big farmers understand that for sustainability reasons, they cannot continue working as they did until now. We have such example in our project. We have a, small, a huge farmer from the Netherlands who wants to use less chemicals in his uh, farm. And uh, we believe it's, it will be a success for us not only to develop the ICT applications, but also to convince some of the farmers that, uh, that are doing industrialized farming right now that it's important to consider also the quality of the food that reaches us. Okay. Thank you. Anna. Thank you, Eleni. Uh, what you said, I think, also relates with the incentive mechanism to engage these user communities. And what you mentioned is these offline meetings with them that are very, uh, I think they're very productive and you can get some out of it. And also, Panagiotta uh, the mentioned microphone. this. Is it open? Oh, yes. And Panayota mentioned this social interaction that are realized inside the plasma or give the chance to people to interact with people and exchange views, etc. that also works on as, as an incentive. And I've also heard of gamification elements, uh, or reputation mechanisms, some uh, financial rewards that work as incentive mechanisms to motivate people to start uh, using such a collaborative platform. Uh, but uh, I don't know exactly if we have some evidence of what of all of these incentive mechanisms work right now and what works and what not. Uh, Eleni said that offline meetings are successful. I don't know if uh, they, there is any experience from other CAPS projects that are uh, going through the last year, if they have some uh, evidence to share with us regarding what they did to engage their user communities. I uh, will be very interested in this. Continue. Uh, next. The rest. Yes. Let's give the floor to everybody first. Um, uh, Leonardo Maccari from Net Commons, University of Trento. Few many things here. Uh, we are in the our first year of uh, project, and we also engage the communities with like physically engaging them. We go there. We go to their meeting, we go to the international meeting, we try to understand, we, w we try to put them in a loop in which we try to understand what are the needs which we elaborate and then we go back to the next meeting offering something. Because we go, we have communities of practitioners, Th these are people that do things and they, they know how to do things. So we do not, if you go there as academics saying, hey, we have this you found the project that we will help you a lot, they will tell us, we have seen a lot of them before you. So, mm, and some of them did not work. And I in this specific community, they even have friction with the academia because some of the protocols that have been developed in the past never actually worked. So they, they were the first one that really put them in practice in an open way and shown that they do not work. And so they have to improve them. And, and just in the few years, in the few last years, the academia and community networks are just going better together because people have started this kind of mechanism. The second thing I wanted to comment on is more on the, on the infrastructure thing. I, it's really impressive to hear that farmers in the Netherlands, they know what machine-to-machine -machine communication is. And at the same time, it, it makes me think that we, we have to take care about the fact that the infrastructure that we provide or we research on or we suggest is something that they can use in a, in a neutral, as neutral way as they need to. 
For instance, machine to machine, it's a keyword that basically replaced ad hoc networking, which was the same thing 10 years ago, but now it's in the end of the ISP, basically. And it's called machine to machine. In this way, we build network infrastructure, we, we help building, we research on network infrastructure that actually should free the people from this kind of problems. And I think that this should be considered upstream in the old, uh, in the old chain because uh, when you use an application, a cloud-based application, or when you use Facebook to do something with your community, you are actually obeying to the rules that the service provider gives you for that specific platform. And this is something that, I mean, we all have to take into account when we propose some platform to our communities. Um, Michael Ferris from the Decarbonet project. <coughs> Uh, we had a slightly different problem with the user engagement because we had some rather strong partners like the, like NOAA, WWF and EarthR. So we had channels to reach users and get them engaged. But we thought of a, a, it a little bit differently because we want to raise awareness about climate change and help people um, find ways to reduce their carbon footprint and stuff like this. But through the communication channels that we have, and even if we want to book advertisements like on Facebook or stuff like this, we would only reach people who are already interested in this stuff. So we're basically getting those people, they play our games, they're learning stuff, but th usually they are already uh, rather involved in this, in this topic already. So it's hard to reach people that uh, that you want to reach because the people that know nothing about climate change climate change you will not address them through our channels because they will never find it because they don't follow all those other channels and don't have their interest their interests set in Facebook or anything where we could reach them so this was maybe our biggest problem we solved it a little bit because we re rewarded players who invited their friends, so we had the chance that they could invite people that maybe don't know that much, but still the problem is still there, that we have a problem to reach people who are not interested in this stuff in the first place. Maybe just quickly a response to how, how to reach communities which are not already, you know, pre they say preaching to converted, so it has a <laughs> church-like <laughs> analogy. But essentially, we have another CAPS project, which is about um, inclusiveness and barriers in cities and, you know, um, finding, mapping and getting rid of those barriers in cities. And we had the same problem, like, you know, people, uh, activists in the inclusiveness area, they were all uh, supporting and they recognized the value and importance. But then what we had to do uh, in order to reach the... Um, uh, unaware people, which, you know, it, unaware doesn't mean they don't care. They are just, uh, they have many things on their plates and there's only so many things you can deal with. But essentially we had like uh, education activities, so we went to schools. We had like uh, mapping parties, so basically we tried to make it uh, attractive uh, interaction events. And the third one was also uh, when there was a uh, worldwide um, day of mapping, like using open street maps. And we had um, um, like uh, famous people just giving YouTube statements in order to say, well, look, um, I actually care for that as well. I'm going to participate in that uh, event on that day. And they could, could then, as ambassadors, could reach their communities, which had a totally completely purpose, but it didn't mean that, you know, like a YouTube rapper couldn't say something about inclusiveness. And um, we are aware that this is not necessarily sustainable. They are not converted from one day to the other one. But essentially, they heard about it, and they had a choice to participate or not. Okay. Uh, I'm Zoe yes. Romano from dsi for eu I just wanted to add a, a comment uh, um, connected with one of the activity uh, and tools that we are developing. So. Um, especially starting from the idea of collecting data and uh, having uh, um, having uh, tools to measure pollution around Europe. Uh, we have, uh, in the past years, there have been uh, some projects working on it. Uh, it's on only one. We have uh, at least four or five examples. And so uh, one uh, uh, 
um, the idea that came to us is that how can you compare this type of project, in which way they are having impact, uh, and in which way th uh, they are growing. Uh, so that's why we, we uh, decided to develop a DSI scale tool that allow us to understand uh, concepts that for some of us are clear, but, but for people that are not um, into the field, it's, uh, it's hard. I give you, uh, it's hard to grasp, for example, when you talk about openness, or when you talk about community, what does it mean that a project has, is open? Does it mean that it just share one file online, or there is a file plus documentation? What are the level of openness that a project uh, can reach? Or for example, community, what does it mean that a project has a community? Does it have? It just have uh, open comments on the website, or do they have like a forum in which there is a conversation going on and they did an effort to get in touch with the real communities online and offline? Do they have a community manager to take care of it? You, so in, in this way, you have some kind, you grasp the different um, layers and the different shades of concepts that are very broad and sometimes for people that are outside of, of this field that are not into the topic so much, it's, um, it's not easy to discriminate and understand uh, which type of uh, project are uh, growing on which level and on which scale. So um, that's why we are doing a series of interviews to um, find what are the metrics of the scale and uh, it's a, an open process. So the tools is on GitHub and uh, we can uh, um, add new uh, metrics on it and find the shades of this metric uh, to go more granular on, on this uh, interesting topics that is about, for example, also the quality of, uh, of the air, uh, sorry, or the, of the data coming from measuring, uh, um, measuring air quality. Is anybody else who has not spoken? Maybe you would like to make a comment? Yes. Uh, okay. Only something about engagement, because uh, in our project there is uh, the platform where there are a lot of people that are sharing uh, stories, a lot of users, and uh, the fact that is really interesting that uh, people are writing long, long uh, posts, long stories. So, um, um, and in fact, there is a community, community management, uh, a lot of uh, offline uh, events to, to seed uh, the conversations. So, uh, the platform, we can say that uh, is working, but uh, for us, um, for us as a public administration, the problem is also to connect uh, these ideas, these people that are hackers, co-designers, but also active people, with people in need. And, uh, but not only people in need, also people that uh, works, uh, people that work uh, in uh, public administration, so they usually uh, do a traditional kind of work uh, in social and health services. For us, it's a challenge of, a pro of the project to create a link between these two works, and this is uh, uh, also the idea that uh, what is happening in our project has to have an impact on uh, other services of uh, public administration and also with uh, people in need. So, so uh, we, are, uh, we are creating a policy making group to try to, um, uh, to find new ways to create this link because it's not uh, simple because um, we are speaking uh, completely different languages, and so, um, but uh, we would like to try to, to do this, uh, and so to, um, um, also uh, now what we are doing, uh, for example, is to report activities. So if we are doing uh, an activity co-design session in Milan, we report, but uh, maybe uh, we can do steps more and uh, try to activate directly people. Uh, on the platform and uh, in the local activities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Any question from the audience? Okay. I, I'm just, now I'm speaking as a participant of the SciCafe 2.0 project, which I didn't present because we were too late. But within this project, we tried a small first attempt to classify types to some, some way similar to what Fabrizio showed before with these axes. Clearly, we have to add more axes. And one or many of them are in particular related to communities. So, which is the, 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 question, the main question that arose here. I mean, which is the community, how we contact or interact uh, in the community, what is a community and so on. So if you agree, uh, I can recontact you and also other CAPS, uh, trying to develop together a way of meta-classifying a, a CAPS. So where in, in these axes uh, a CAPS can be put and uh, especially with concerning uh, clearly the, the topics, uh, the payoff of users, so why users should join the, the CAPS you know, in some abstract way, and also what is a community, which are, what are the methods. Because I think that uh, there is a, a large potentiality of sharing the resources among us, among all, uh, all initiatives that have to deal with uh, uh, so citizens essentially, and which are not so uh, common to, so easy to be uh, extracted from the experience of others. So we present the results, but we do not present the methods. And I think that uh, maybe we could uh, promote the sharing of uh, successful methods because uh, you can save a lot of efforts from other projects that, are, that have a common goal. This is my, come here. Just on uh, the last point, very quickly, the CHIC uh, project has the aim now to map the best practices, uh, not in terms of the best project, but exactly uh, at qualitative level how you do engagement in a successful way. There is no one way of doing it successfully, but in different situations, in different scenarios, what worked and what did not work, and for this in terms of sustainability, scaling up, and we will have to decide all together what are the topics that are important because we we have learned from the previous CAPS project uh, how to manage the impact, how to evaluate the impact. But uh, at quantitative level, you can say, okay, they did uh, 25 pilots and engaged uh, 100,000 people. That is interesting, of course, but how they did and uh, what worked and what did not work. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. So if we can pass it to the next generation, what we learn, and I think it's uh, value added. So yeah, let's let's do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have the platform. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I didn't present myself. I'm Xenia from Next Leap. In Next Leap, we have another problem. Uh, we have something in common with uh, Net Commons because we work with people who do things, and uh, we cannot say that we work with users because what we do is that we collaborate with some uh, developers, uh, the cryptographers, the cypherpunks, and other societies. Sometimes they are very alternative, and it's complicated to reach them because of privacy and security concerns that they have. Uh, the U EU label do not, does not simplify the task. So um, I am a sociologist and I have to go on field and I like being with these people, but sometimes it's very hard to articulate between our um, uh, CAPS uh, label and uh, the um, values that our actors have. Sometimes they are uh, openly anarchist and they reivindicate um, like the skepticism towards such projects and also they think that they already have all the tools that they need and it's very complicated to say hey we will provide in three years we will give you new protocols for encryption or well, would you like to use them so for us the problem is how to propose a new product because our pr uh, our results are uh, pieces of code it's not um, a website or something it's the protocols that uh, must be integrated in the existing tools or must be integrated in new uh, encryption uh, applications. 
So maybe some of uh, the uh, experienced CAPS participants could share his or her um, success in this field. What do you do in order to um, break this skepticism? Uh, or not to break because I don't like this word, but to work with this and to cope with um, uh, values of the people, of communities with whom you work and try to uh, work together with them and not for them. Uh, because uh, yeah, for my research, I observed civic hackathons uh, that, uh, where developers would code products for people in need. Um, but these publics, uh, publics in need, uh, I use word public uh, like John Dewey used it in his uh, book, Public and Its Problems. Uh, the publics that are like simulated by uh, an existing trouble, an existing problem, and they will look for solutions. They will come to us and ask, would you please code a tool for, for, for us? But another situation is when we want to propose a product to people who are not constituted as publics. So for me, that is what, like, hunting me in my nightmares <laughs> when I think of how to make Nextleap as a successful project. So if, um, okay, thank any you. advices are welcome. Thank you. I think we, we heard a number of big challenges, so I'm, I'm sure that all these projects will deliver at the end and all these big challenges will be addressed uh, in the near future. Uh, is there any question from the audience? If not, I'd like to thank uh, the participants. Uh, you are free, you help yourself because uh, there is no lunch for today, but uh, there are a lot of places in nearby. We see, so I, I, some of the workshops will start in, so in five minutes, others uh, will start in one hour. So have a, have a look. Remember, left to the end, left again, and then uh, you arrive to the uh, meeting. Tomorrow there will be in Novoli, which is a, a different location. There are directions on the site. Uh, the video recording of today and the slides, if you agree clearly, uh, will be put on the website. And, and also, all of, if you have ideas, please send me just short sentences that I collecting all together on a page so that uh, from this round table will, uh, people can extract the knowledge and uh, say, have uh, uh, food for thoughts. Okay, so thank you again. <laughs>